afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome to the side event of the Global Conference on Sustainable Mechanization. The side event is called Voices of Youth for Sustainable Mechanization and Digitalization. And um, the Global Conference started yesterday, it's happening today, and it's also going after uh, for tomorrow until tomorrow we also have a very great interesting exhibition take a look take selfies we have equipment and machinery of all sizes and along the value chain so i think this is a unique opportunity let's you know let's write let's take selfies um my name is Maylin flores rojas i work with fao uh, at the plant production and protection division in headquarters and um, i work in the same topic as the global conference and uh, I am also happy to be the chairperson of the youth group of my division, and I'm going to be moderating today's session with my colleague, Vujo. Thank you so much, Melin. Uh, greetings to all. My name is Vujo Mapango. I am co-moderating this session with you. We cannot talk about sustainability of agriculture without the young people. We are the future of agriculture. So um, it's a pleasure that I stand here today um, an agriculture engineer by profession and training, and I am supporting the mechanization team. As, um, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. So please, uh, let's keep it engaged. For those that are joining us online, please feel free to send your questions and we'll be there to answer and where you are joining us from. Thank you, Meili. Great, thank you so much. So now let's move to the opening remarks. So I have good news. We are lucky enough to have with us someone that loves youth and trusts that we can do a lot in support of the transformation of the sustainable agri-food systems. I'm talking about the Deputy Director General of FAO, Beth Beckel. Dear DGG, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You actually have someone here with you who still thinks that she's young herself, but um, maybe maybe not quite as young as some of our uh, impressive uh, presenters here. But thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate. You are combining a number of topics and, and areas that are extremely personally motivating and inspiring to me, and certainly the opportunity to engage the next generation of talent in food and agriculture is something that I care very deeply about. But um, I think many of you have seen me these last few days. Um, you haven't seen me climbing or driving on the equipment, but um, it's, a, it's a favorite part of agriculture for me, this space of mechanization, equipment, technology, and innovation. I grew up on a family farm in the Midwest of the United States. My sister uh, actually operates that farm today, and uh, she is quite comfortable uh, in operating equipment like we see uh, here uh, right on the FAO premise, making important purchasing decisions, evaluation decisions about not only technology, but about seed varieties, about marketing decisions, how and when we plant and when we harvest, our conservation practices. Um, that's a lot of decision making for a young person to take on. And I have a feeling we are going to hear from our presenters today about some of their own personal experiences and how they have been active, how they have been built businesses, how they have engaged with farmers, and how they have positioned themselves inside the agri-food system. Just really briefly, because I don't want to take time in this program uh, from an FAO position, because this is an event that is focused on the people who are here with us, but I've given some thought about sort of this relationship uh, that exists between organizations like FAO and young people and, and the next generation that, that is excited to be a part of food and agriculture. And I've thought about what is it that we need from each other? And if I were to say, what do we need from youth, from the next generation? We need your fresh perspectives. We need your enthusiasm. And we also need your inherent understanding of modern and digital technologies. This is a generation that was born into a digital world. You are still learning, you are still adapting, you are still getting faster, getting better, advancing yourselves, but it comes so naturally to all of you. And that is a huge asset 
when we think about the developments in food and agriculture. Your technology skills, again, you're proficient, you're adaptable. These are incredible assets as we see agriculture moving from 1.0 to 3.0 to now we talk about agriculture version 5.0 that's moved beyond even digitalization. More importantly, I think you have the mindset, you have the imagination, you have the creativity that's needed more than ever to reimagine food and agriculture. We talk about that a lot in this organization, transforming agri-food systems. Transformation is a big word. Um, that means a lot of change. It means that we need bold ideas. It means that, again, we need create creativity. And so I think from the presentations that we will uh, see today and the inputs that will be provided, I think we'll hear um, just how encouraging that change uh, is coming. But the flip side to this is, what should you expect from us? What should you expect from the generation or generations that have come before you, organizations like FAO? And one thing that I think we can commit to you is first, we have to do a better job of giving you more and frequent platforms like this. We have got to continue to include you bring your stories and your narratives into a sustainable livestock conference, a global sustainable mechanization conference, the ongoing activities, forums, venues, places where leaders and decision makers and private sector executives and civil society leaders all come together. You have to be here with us. And I know you want to be, but it is also our responsibility to give you this space. We also, I think, have to help you tell a better story about agri-food systems. It's getting harder and harder to convince a generation that is growing farther and farther away from a farm about the, the inspiring opportunities that come by being a part of food and agriculture. So the rest of us have to change the way we communicate. We have to change the visuals. We have to change our stories on our websites. We have to change our press releases. We have to change the, the storytelling, the communication about food and agriculture. And that's another place where we need help from you. And the final thing, which is I think a great way to close and to conclude my opening remarks, we have to get out of your way. Eventually, there is a time that comes when your leadership your ability to have the voice in the room, your ability to be on the podium, to be an equal representation in these venues is really important. So with that, I'm going to turn the button off and get out of your way, stay with you, but be here to listen to your own stories, the challenges you face, the things that you're looking to achieve, and really pleased to be able to have all of you with us for this really important and historic week at FAO. Thanks. Thank you. I, I told you she loves us, so let's take this opportunity, you know. Um, thank you so much, DDG, Beth, for the space, for the time, and the trust in us. This is great. Now, we have five speakers coming from all over the world. So let's travel now to Africa. Let's start and go to Cote d'Ivoire. I would like to um, ask Kaume Saude to please provide the presentation. He is the CEO and founder of Firm Bio. He will be presenting in French. So for those of you who need translation, use the headset and select the right channel. And for those connecting online, please uh, select the circle button and select the right, uh, the right language. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Kwame Samuel. Je suis ingénieur agronome de formation et je suis content aujourd'hui d'avoir cette tribune pour parler de mon expérience, l'expérience de mon entreprise. Je vais faire une présentation sur ma structure et 
Mon entreprise s'appelle Fembio SRL. Elle a été créée en 2016 à l'issue du prix d'incubation du jeune entrepreneur émergent. C'est un, un prix qui récompense les jeunes qui veulent entreprendre dans mon pays, la Côte d'Ivoire. Et notre entreprise est focalisée sur la chaîne de valeur manioc, de la production à la transformation. Et pour arriver à ce... Qu'est-ce qui m'a motivé à créer cette entreprise C'est la difficulté qu'ont nos parents à cultiver. Vous savez, en Afrique, c'est très difficile de faire la culture. Et ce qui m'a motivé en plus, c'est qu'il y avait des problèmes de commercialisation de la production de mes parents. Il y a aussi la pénibilité due au travail agricole. Et aujourd'hui, nous voyons la rareté de la main dœuvre dans nos secteurs agricoles. Mais les problèmes que nous dressons dans notre entreprise, c'est les problèmes de semences. Vous savez, l'intrant agricole, qui est la semence de qualité, devient de plus en plus rare dans nos secteurs. Donc notre entreprise se propose de dresser la question de la semence, la question liée au problème de commercialisation et la, les questions liées au désintérêt des jeunes du métier de producteur. Aujourd'hui, les jeunes ne veulent plus faire le métier de producteur parce qu'ils ont vu des parents souffrir dans le champ. Et nous, nous, nous travaillons à redresser cette question. Quels sont les services que notre entreprise offre Notre entreprise fonctionne avec trois départements qui sont en synergie, un service de production de semences, un service de contractualisation de la commercialisation et puis un service de mécanisation. Ces services fonctionnent en synergie parce que notre entreprise dispose elle-même de ses sites de production de sa semence et puis nous contractualisons avec les agro-industriels de notre zone pour pouvoir leur livrer la production issue de notre production. Nous faisons également dans la préparation du sol pour les producteurs. Parmi la préparation du sol, vous savez, il faut le labour, le pulvérisage, le bionnage et nous faisons la production de semences. Quand je dis semences, je parle ici de la semence de manioc avec plusieurs variétés. Qu'est-ce que nous faisons Nous achetons avec les centres de recherche les variétés améliorées de semences et nous venons les multiplier sur nos parcelles. Et plus tard, nous distribuons ces semences aux producteurs qui en ont besoin pour faire leur culture. Nous faisons également les traitements phytosanitaires. Nous avons des équipements pour faire les traitements phytosanitaires pour les producteurs. Et puis, nous faisons tout ce qui est entretien de culture, c'est-à-dire le désherbage et la récolte. En plus de ces services, nous, nos clients sont des producteurs. Mais quels producteurs Ils sont issus d'une plateforme dédiée à la production du manioc. Et cette plateforme compte aujourd'hui 206 coopératives et qui regroupe au total 1850 producteurs individuels. Et ces producteurs individuels ont des besoins qui s'expriment chaque jour, qui ne s'arrêtent pas que à la prestation de services mécanisés, qui va au-delà de la prestation de services mécanisés, tels que des semences de qualité et surtout la disponibilité de ces services au temps voulu. Parce que nous savons que la production agricole suit un calendrier agricole. Aujourd'hui, notre plus grand succès est, notre, est la reconnaissance de nos activités. Comme j'ai dit tantôt, nous avons commencé en 2016 et c'est difficile pour des jeunes d'acheter du matériel agricole. Mais avec les efforts que nous avons consentis, l'État de Côte d'Ivoire nous a reconnus en tant qu'acteurs de la mécanisation. Et l'année dernière, en 2022, nous avons pu faire 1255 états de prestations pour le profit des membres de notre plateforme. Aujourd'hui, l'entreprise compte 14 employés permanents, 25 saisonniers et 10 occasionnels qui travaillent à la mise en place de tout ce dispositif de production de semences, de prestations de services et de contractualisation. Nous avons mis en place pour pérenniser nos activités un modèle économique. Ce modèle économique n'est pas le fruit de notre réflexion à nous. Nous avons travaillé avec les producteurs pour que ce modèle puisse répondre à eux leurs problèmes. Premièrement, qu'est-ce que nous avons fait Nous avons ici les agro-industriels qui ont un besoin de matières premières. Ils nous expriment ce besoin. Nous, nous travaillons à contractualiser avec eux, à signer avec eux. Parce que l'agro-industriel a besoin de qualité en matières premières et puis de quantité. Et pour cela, nous contractualisons avec eux. Une fois que nous avons contractualisé avec eux, notre entreprise se charge de la production de semences. Et la semence... La production de semences. 
Une fois que la semence est produite, nous donnons ces semences aux producteurs regroupés en plateforme. Nous avons créé un bloc et chaque producteur qui est sur un bloc reçoit la semence de notre part et reçoit aussi les services mécanisés de notre part. Une fois que la production est terminée, nous faisons nous-mêmes la récolte et donnons la production aux industriels. Ce qui permet à l'agriculteur d'aujourd'hui qui fait le manioc avec nous de ne plus se soucier de la question de commercialisation. Parce que vous pouvez avoir produit, mais si vous ne vendez pas votre production, vous perdez. Et ce modèle nous permet également de pérenniser nos activités de prestation. Aujourd'hui, pour que nous puissions continuer de faire la prestation, nous devons avoir un calendrier dédié à la production. Et c'est ce que ce modèle économique nous permet de faire. Et quand vous voyez la photo, c'est que nous travaillons avec les producteurs, nous discutons avec eux de ce qu'ils qu veulent et quel est leur problème auquel nous allons apporter des solutions. Pour continuer, quelqu'un qui souhaiterait faire de la prestation de service ou s'inspirer de notre exemple doit d'abord se passionner à résoudre un problème dans son milieu. Je suis un agriculteur, je vais au champ comme tout le monde, mais je suis passionné de régler les problèmes liés à la commercialisation et à la production mécanisée. J'ai également compris qu'il nous faut de la formation. La gestion du matériel agricole d'une entreprise de prestation requiert des compétences techniques, managériales et financières. Et cette formation, elle est nécessaire. C'est indispensable pour qu'une entreprise puisse évoluer. Nous avons aussi besoin de persévérer. Ici, l'occasion ne nous est pas donnée de, 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 de talonner sur les problèmes, mais c'est pour dire que quelqu'un qui veut faire une entreprise agricole doit être persévérant. Nous rencontrons tous les jours des difficultés liées à nos activités, mais nous transformons ces difficultés en solutions. Ça, ça nous encourage à continuer de donner de la priorité à ce qui est. Et pour terminer, je pense que nous devons développer un modèle économique qui arrange tout le monde, y compris le producteur, y compris nous qui faisons la prestation de services, y compris tous ces acteurs qui interviennent dans ce système. Je, je souhaiterais également que notre modèle puisse inspirer certains et qu'ils puissent nous, de, nous encourager à continuer à, à donner le service de mécanisation aux acteurs du monde agricole en Côte d'Ivoire. Merci. Thank you. Kaume, passion, hard work and problem solving. That's all. Thank you so much. I think it's so inspiring your story. Thanks to you now, we have jobs in the rural communities. We have less drudgery for women and men farmers. And we have, you are solving problems in real time for farmers. That is so inspiring. And everything started because you were given an award and you took that information and you created your own enterprise. You are a champion. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. At this time, we move all the way from Africa. From Africa, we move all the way to Latin America. And um, this is um, time for Yashim Reyes, who is working as a technical advisor for the Center for the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT. She's going to give us her work in CIMIT and let us listen attentively. Good afternoon. I'm Yashim Reyes, a, a technical farm advisor from uh, the south of Mexico and local collaborator of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico. I am in charge of a machine hire center in Oaxaca, Mexico, and today I'm going to talk briefly about the role and function uh, of this hire center, the machine renting system, the work with the farmers and future goals. Uh, maize is the most important crop in Oaxaca, both nutritionally and culturally. Uh, maize consumption in Mexico is high, with an average per capita consumption of 
four kilograms annually, mainly in the form of tortillas. Uh, maize production in Oaxaca is really predominantly on rainy feed agriculture, with one with with one main production season in the summer and with a small land fraction posing challenges for large scale mechanization. Um, the machinery center originated in 2030 from the collaboration of CIMIT and the government of Mexico to bring in new technologies close to farmers. My role is to control the output of the machines, the maintenance of these machines, and the training of producers, students, and agricultural technicians. In this center, evaluation of cedar and shilling machines are carried out. With the results obtained, information is generated that will be that will help the preparation of scientific articles, dissemination, and recommendation of machinery improvements in design. Etc. Uh, there are various limitations to agricultural mechanization, but the main ones in the regions each in which we work are the following. Limited availability of four wheat tractors as power source, including operators. Fields are small and often dispersed in poorly accessible areas. A strong cultural adherence to more traditional farming practice, manual and animal drawn implements. Mm, the choice of location considered centric to the local town, ample space for machinery storage and easy of access. The higher center serves local farmers, neighboring towns, agronomists and NGOs working in the region. The application process involves checking the machines availability and sketching uh, visit to the center. The details, the details of the machines, including the farmer's name, location, activity, and delivery date are recorded. Upon return, each machine is inspected for condition. The maintenance and operation of the machinery center is based on, on the operation of users. When they return the, the, the loaned machine, a minimum recovery fee is received. This money is used to purchase spare parts or supply to keep the machines in good condition. Um, recommendations for a specific machine and practice are based on discussions with farmers or local technicians, considering their specific needs, land conditions, available labor, and production systems. This helps farmers make informed decisions when pur purchasing machinery in the future. Uh, we have this uh, equipment uh, in this point. Um, minimal till precision seed drive for life, four wheel tractor, two wheel tractor, multi-purpose, uh, multi-group planter for two wheel tractors, set of animal drum planters uh, for different conditions, Push card manual sprayer, set of maize sealers, hermetic metal sealer for granny storage. In this photo, we can see the conventional planting method. Work animals are used to drain the furrows, but the planting is manual, with limited nutrition at the beginning of the crop, and the number of people working is a minimum of three, pe three people. Post harvest shelling is done manually, leading to green loses and significant pest release loses. Conventionally, the farmer owed the shelling activity for a period of two to six months after the harvest. During this time, they can lose up to 50% of their harvest due to fungi or grain pest. One of the important jobs carried out in this machinery center is the field evaluation of the different models of seeders that are available. The information generated will be used for the anal analysis and development of scientific information that will help agricultural producers and technicians in making decisions during a mechanization process or a, sp a specific place. We call this process scientific dissemination. 
with important data such as planting capacity, duration of work, animals required, and suitability for the various production systems. In these evaluations, we evolve students from different engineering fields related to the field and mechanization to generate greater interest in the then about agricultural machinery. With this evaluation, we can, we can conclude that the work time used in the planting activity can be reduced by 50% cost for the use of labor, a reducer and initial nutrition can be provided to the crop to be established which is complemented in, with integrated management during development help increase crop yield. Working with local blacksmiths and using the first two seeders have begun to be developed locally as part of an innovation network, which seeks to include local blacksmiths, manufacturers, suppliers, and students interest in the develop of technologies with sensor or cell phone application that can help in field activities. The image shows it that sowing with an animal powered cedar fertilizer shows better crop develop and can increase grain production by 40%. Using resource most, more efficiently compared to conventional sowing, which is why it is important work in the branch of mechanization. We offer different options of shelling machines to help farmers choose the ideal and one according to their production needs. It is important to mention that with these maize shillers and complementary post-harvest advice, we have helped reduce grain losses by up to 40%. These shillers are easy found in the market. This evaluation help is help use generate information for the producer regarding shelling efficiency, shelling quality, proper handling of these shellers, and care and maintenance recommendations. Having different options, they carry out an activity help farmers to select the best option according the, to their needs, electric versus petrol engine, mobile versus stationary, difference in capacity, in this evaluation, we also include students from careers related to agronomy to generate great interest in the topic of post-harvest. The rental center is managed by women, which also facilitates interaction with women farmers. In addition, animal drown and, and, and manual seders along great participation of women, young people, and other adults in field activities. An important point in the work career of this the interaction with children of farmers who study agronomy or relate careers. They are actively involved in the search for solutions to the challenge present in the planting of basic grains in their localities. In the, in this, in the last two years, the interest of local universities knowing, evaluate, evaluating and studying the machines available at our rental center has increased. We have reserved young people who are doing thesis work in relation to the use of agricultural machinery and training on agricultural machinery has been carried out with the various groups of of students. One of the challenges we currently face in the low availability of work animals. Another important issue due to the various social factors such as migration is that the majority of the population involved in the field are older adults and women. So other options are being explored such as the two-wheel tractors which has generated great interest in producers and has even attracted the, att the attention of young local farmers. At CIMIT we are convinced that the newer gen generations will be, will be the support of the older generations always as the one in charge of food security in towns and cities alike providing them with tailored tools to make their productive systems more efficient and sustainably is the best way to ensure food sovereignty in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that um, elaborate uh, presentation on the role that uh, the youth have in international research, such as what CIMIT is doing. Yeah, this is indeed very important. It reminds me of my experience as I worked on a farm back in Zambia, working with farmers. So it needs passion, it needs dedication as we support uh, smallholders and their roles that they play in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Now, from Latin America, let's go to Asia. Our third speaker is Sanjib Bimali. He is an agricultural engineer working with the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock in Nepal. Sanjib, the floor is yours. Uh, respected Chair, uh, good afternoon and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sanjib Bimali, an agriculture engineer with profession as well as training. Uh, I work for Center, of, Center for Agriculture Mechanization Development and Mechanization Promotion. It's a focal agency of government of Nepal that is been implementing agriculture mechanization promotion in Nepal. And its main focus is creating enabling environment for business development as well as promotion of agriculture machinery over Nepal. Besides mechanization, it has been involved in uh, agriculture infrastructure development in Nepal. Uh, as an agriculture engineer in this institution, my roles are uh, in various sectors, uh, including policy formulation, a coordination with CBOs, INGOs, and other governments like uh, provincial governments and local government. Uh, I am directly involved in mechanization promotion, as well as infrastructure development and their procurements over Nepal. Uh, when we talk about mechanization in Nepal, it has been a history of 80 years uh, is recorded. In 1953, uh, establishment of agriculture engineering unit under the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Livestock Development was the first pillar for agriculture mechanization in Nepal. Uh, it is an extension-based organization. Uh, after that, in 1951, Agriculture Engineering Division, AED, was established. It is an institution for the agriculture mechanization research. And in 2000, uh, institute for, institution for uh, education, a BE uh, Bachelor in Engineering program under TU was established. I am lucky to say that I am a graduate from the same university and same college. Uh, in 2004, the modern day agriculture uh, mechanization of Nepal has been started with the establishment of uh, directors of agriculture engineering, uh, directors of agriculture engineering, and currently I'm working on the upgraded version of that organization. In 2014, after the establishment of DOA engineering, we have, we have released our first agriculture mechanization policies, and with the concept of mechanization policies over there in 2018, we are able to establish an agriculture mechanization training center in 2018. Uh, let's talk about policies and strategies in agriculture mechanization sector of Nepal. When we talk about policies, let's start with the constitution of Nepal. The constitution of Nepal, uh, 2072 is 2015, has provision to arrange the agriculture tools as well as assess to the market with appropriate price of the product. And another most important strategy is agriculture development strategy. Uh, it's a 20 years uh, strategic planning for uh, promotion and development of agriculture in Nepal. It has considered agriculture mechanization is one of the most important 13 pillar in Nepal. And one of the important thing that it has identified is private sector mechanization uh, is one of the best way for mechanization. So it considered the private sector is a, a major player to boost the agriculture mechanization in Nepal. And these are the subsidiary policies. And let's talk about major sectoral policies in agriculture mechanization. Uh, agriculture mechanization promotion policies. 2014 is uh, the sectoral policy for agriculture mechanization promotion in Nepal. It has a uh, four objective, basically uh, to increase the product productivity. And for this, a government believed that subsidy in agriculture mechanization and promotion of local and innovation technology could be done. In the similar way to develop the services and business of agriculture mechanization, promotion of uh, local industries and 
establishment of custom hiring center and other institution could be done at the same time promotion of women and environment friendly agriculture machineries uh, we have been doing promotion of women responsive machinery as well as conservation uh, conservation agriculture machineries uh, finally at the fourth objective is to strengthen and establish a organization setup for that we have been providing training and trying to develop the entrepreneur setup over there and at the same time we have been also establishing uh, the testing center uh, currently let me talk about that uh, in the present time we have almost set up uh, the institutional setup and now we now we are uh, in a policy setup for this uh, testing center. Soon, one or two years, we will be uh, able to test our first machine legally over Nepal. And uh, talking about the supports for youth, youth-led agriculture in Nepal, we are basically focusing on three things. Uh, machinery promotion activities, which include uh, agriculture machinery uh, exhibition, technology demonstration, and subsidy scheme. Basically, when we talk about uh, make, make machinery exhibition, we are uh, we had so far conducted fifth exhibition, and we are planning to conduct another by the end of the 23 or early 24. And when we talk about uh, technology demonstration, we have been doing a field level machinery use and its demonstration over there. And regarding the subsidy, government has a policy uh, uh, policy of excise duty free, 1% tax, and VAT exempted in majority of agriculture machineries. Besides that, 50% subsidies is given on the machineries from land preparation to post service by a central government, federal government, as well as the local government. When you talk about the next uh, in innovation for youth, we, we are providing capacity build of trainings. And there are basically four different types of training we have been proposed. First one is operation and machinery use training. Uh, we are providing taught as well as field level training in all the categories. Operation of mini tiller, power tiller, seed drills, and related machineries uh, is provided under these categories. And similarly, repair and maintenance training. Both this training is provided in terms of TOT as well as INT. And repair and maintenance of small machinery, especially mean tiller, power tiller, pump set, reapers type of machine are promoted over there. And another is business development training. We have been focusing uh, for institution we, to, to create the business over there. So we have been providing business development training, especially for custom hiring center, as well as post service center and other training. This type of training include the uh, local fabricator, as my earlier presenter has presented that blacksmith trainings were present in their place too. So does in our place, we are also providing the blacksmith training. And the next part is institutional development. When we give, when we provide the trainings and capacitate the people, we try to uh, establish or develop a three type of organization, uh, mainly a resource center, which provide the facility of repair and maintenance uh, to the local machineries uh, users, as well as it also has to fabricate the local product. And another is post harvest center, which basically uh, focus on reducing the post harvest loss. So far, now we have around a 374 number of customer uh, post harvest center. And another and most promising, most talked talk business or uh, talked institution is a uh, custom hiring center, which provides the rental services in Nepal. And so far, now we have been able to establish 581. Uh, numbers of custom hiring center uh, despite the number is used but their capacity development and institutional backup need to be done it we will be doing in couple of years and another part is uh, with the fao support in uh, tcp we have we were able to establish two custom hiring center i have mentioned it over there too uh, let's talk something about custom hiring center in Nepal. Basically, we have uh, two models of custom hiring center. One is private managed, and another is uh, community managed. When we talk about community managed, basically there are other three models, like managed by farmers group, managed by uh, cooperative, and we had tried newly in support of FEO uh, organization that is mechanized and service group. Uh, which is the organization which directly or which is delegately to conduct the custom hiring center only over Nepal. Uh, 
let's talk about ICT in agriculture sector in Nepal. When we talk about ICTs and IOTs, it is a uh, it is booming globally across the world. And in case of Nepal, uh, we have been using ICT in uh, production estimation, especially for rice, meteorological information from weather station to farmers. Farmer listing is another form of ICT in Nepal. Hiring services on call and mobile apps like uh, Smart Krishi and Digo Krishi is providing uh, services from cultivation to post harvest and online marketing, especially after COVID, the online marketing of vegetable has been really boom of in our place. And I want to conclude my presentation with uh, some of the area of improvements in youth-led agriculture mechanism. Uh, I personally believe in a developing country like my, uh, we need a platform for the young researchers like this so that we can discuss about uh, what's going on across the globe. At the same similar type, we need some mentorship uh, program to boost off uh, what we have now and what we are going to do. And another part is to support the private sector. I mean, in terms of uh, startup program, we need to support the private sector who are working uh, for agriculture as well as agriculture mechanization sectors. And lastly, uh, while making the budget, we need to focus on youth and woman friendly budget and activities as well. Uh, thank you. With this, I want to conclude my thank you for hearing me again. Sanjeev, you mentioned training, and we need training, 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 training. We need so much training in the rural communities, not only for the operation, the safety operation of machines, but also for the business. You need to make money when you have mechanization. Otherwise, once it's broken, what do you do with it? You know, you need money to maintain it. You need money to repair it. So thank you so much for addressing that. And thank you so much also for working us through the policy and how that policy becomes action real action in the field. Thank you so much. I wanted to also uh, introduce Lucia that is just there drawing quietly, but uh, putting together so a beautiful piece for us of uh, you know, a visual recording of this event. So we will have that with us and uh, thank you so much Lucia. And also for you, start thinking of the questions that you have for our speakers because after the presentation we will have a session of q a and for those also online go to the chat box in the q a and then post your question over thank you so much melin for 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 that elaborate um explanation and thank you sanjeev for that elaborate presentation um one thing in common with all the presenters is that they are all working hands-on with farmers in the field yeah, so what we are presenting as young people this afternoon is not, uh, is not theoretical. It's something being done physically in the ground with farmers, seeing their struggles and their challenges. And um, being in a digital age, we are having a speaker with us. Her name is uh, Sisa Chekna. She's joining us um, from Mauritius. She's the co-founder and catalyst of Hadina Rimtik Incubation in Mauritania and she'll be connecting with us uh, via Zoom. Uh, that's for the audience that uh, are not able to use English, you can tune to the uh, French, you can choose to the, um, to the English channel. That's the same for those joining us online. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me well? Hello. So um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak um, at this conference and also present uh, the work of Hadina Rimtik, uh, the business incubator based in Mauritania, uh, and our experience, especially in the uh, digitalization of the agri-food sector in Mauritania. Uh, will I share my presentation or will it be uh, projected online? Sorry. Please share your presentation. Okay, okay. Okay, just give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, so do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so um, I'll be presenting the work of the business incubator Hadina Rintik based in Mauritania. Uh, 
so Hadina is a business incubator uh, created in 2015. Our vision is to emulate an entrepreneurial ecosystem with a strong and sustainable economic and social impact. So we do that by creating employment opportunities in the local markets, uh, work on promoting innovation and commercializing technologies. And we also provide capacity building and training opportunities for young people, as well as support for business acceleration and growth. So overall, we work with many actors to create a stimulating environment for uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, including the government, the private sector, the finance uh, institution, as well as development partners. So we kind of follow a triple helix model of innovation to that implicate the government, the industries, and the uh, academia universities to uh, uh, foster better synergies between uh, these actors and also generate wealth and economic growth. So our approach uh, of work is to initially uh, start analyzing the local uh, context and also uh, um, identify the most pressing, pressing development issues and work with partners and innovators to uh, implement solutions uh, in an open innovation and co-creation process. So we provide the innovators with the services and the help they need to put in place these uh, innovative solutions. And we help them uh, in the business development and the acceleration of their businesses. So, so as I said, we uh, first we start by ident identifying the opportunities in the local market and the, lo and the most pressing uh, uh, issues, and then we work with innovators and stakeholders in the idea idealization uh, phase to co-create the product and then test the services and products in the market with them. And then we help them also in a design thinking and lean startup approach to set up their businesses and to go to market. And then we help them also afterward in the expansion phase of their enterprises. So we provide them with a pool of experts and coaches uh, to help them in the uh, business development aspects and also in the technical uh, aspects. And we also provide them with consulting services in regards to the legal and finance uh, um, aspect of their businesses. For some programs, we also provide seed funding, and for all businesses, we provide networking and, business and finance opportunities for them. So our range of services covers the partners. We provide development of innovative solutions for them. We help them implement entrepreneurship and innovation program in Mauritania, and we help them also execute their CSR strategy. And, and we do also smart sourcing of innovators and, and, and talent for them. For the innovators and entrepreneur, we provide uh, an equipped co-working space with many services for uh, to help them with, the, with their uh, businesses. We also provide mentoring and coaching, and we also provide business development and finance opportunities. So to help you uh, quickly understand our history and where we came from, uh, I'm going to go quickly into our achievements and timeline and then talk about our experience in the agri-food sector. So Hadina was created in the beginning of 2015 uh, after the mobile application challenge that we launched in 2014. Uh, because we wanted to diagnose the ecosystem and 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 see the readiness of the uh, local market for an incubator we were the first business incubator in Mauritania so from 2015 to 2017 it was basically an experimentation and creation phase for the incubator we did a lot of training, a lot of sensibilization, a lot of capacity building, and we also worked mainly on preparing the ecosystem for the new concepts in relation to startups, innovation, entrepreneurship, and incubation. So we did also an evaluation of many approaches and you know, innovative approaches and technologies to the local context, and we uh, tried to tailor our programs to, to, to the local needs. Uh, so in 2016, we launched our first incubation program, which is which, which was basically also an experimentation. 
And from 2017 to 2020, we started, I would say, more elaborated and, uh, and uh, targeted uh, incubation program. So we did uh, Marathon de l'Entrepreneur with the World Bank in 2017, which was uh, an entrepreneurship competition, uh, followed by a six-month incubation program for uh, 10 startups. And this experience was really successful that the World Bank ended up implementing this experience, this program in, in the Sahel region in five other countries. So in 2020, we became like everyone else. We became more aware of the need of food security and also of uh, relying on internal resources to uh, make our communities more resilient. So we started working with the agri-food uh, businesses and also working with projects to reinforce uh, uh, community resilience. And um, so we did a lot of proof of concept, a lot of MVP and market uh, 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 MVPs with startups in the uh, agricultural sector, in healthcare and waste management. And from 2021 to 2023, uh, we, um, we focused on, uh, on, on, on basically mostly on training to provide more uh, employment opportunities to entrepreneurs. We also, and for young people, we also provided uh, a STEM education center uh, to allow kids and also young graduates to uh, benefit from uh, advanced digital training. And we launched our first agri-entrepreneurship program in partnership with the FAO. And uh, we also, uh, in 2023, we, uh, we started a, a business acceleration program with BMC Bank, and we put in place a venture capital with, with the bank. And we also started, from 2022, started expanding our activities to other regions, especially the agricultural regions and the more vulnerable regions in the countries. So uh, uh, to talk about the, our digitalization project in the agri-food sector. So in last year, in 2022, we, we launched our agri-entrepreneurship program uh, with the FAO. And we started this program by an assessment of the digital fracture in Mauritania and, and to see its impact on the sector and also to evaluate the use of some technologies in, in the sector, uh, such as online marketplaces, uh, 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 drone monitoring, uh, access to information, all of that in, in the uh, and even the use of some basic social media for commercializing uh, uh, products. So we worked uh and and also this program also provided a six month uh, uh incubation or acceleration program for for 10 uh businesses in the agri-food sector and we also launched uh, uh our agricultural innovation center uh in one of the most important uh agricultural cities in mauritania with the, with with the help of uh, university uh, EZ based in Rosso, so this center provided training, digital literacy training to farmers, and also provided access to online marketplace uh, to help them uh, uh, sell their products online, and also a crowdfunding platform to to, to seek funding. And it also provided services uh, for drone monitoring and also a data observatory where they can access information and, and data to increase their productivity and also to uh, decrease their cost and all of that. So, uh, of course, we, we had a lot of challenges because of the informal uh, nature of the agriculture sector and also because of the lack of infrastructure um, and electricity uh, uh, in many regions. And also uh, the road also make it really difficult for farmers and for us through the marketplace to transport the, the produce to the local market to other cities. So there is also uh, the lack of stock keeping units, which is a major problem for farmers in Mauritania. And also the, the readiness and the digital skills for Mauritanian users make it really difficult for them to adapt new technologies and use them for their daily tasks and, and, and businesses. And there is also the problem with the complex regulatory environment 
for startups and new businesses. We, we don't have any legal, legal framework for new businesses. And last year, we worked with the government and many actors to put in place the Startup Act, which will offer tax break and incentives for new businesses and startups. We would also continue working on training uh, for users and for farmers in rural areas to help them uh, benefit from the services of the Innovation Center. And we also, the Innovation Center would also keep playing the role of the intermediary between farmers and these uh, platforms, Hassad platform to enable more inclusive access to market and financial, uh, financial opportunities for small scale producers. So these are some of the uh, uh, pictures from our workshops during that program and also a screenshot of the platform and some of our activities. So uh, in the last uh, eight, nine years, we, we managed to uh, put in place a lot of program. We still learn it as we go. Uh, because the environment is very complex, uh, uh, but we we managed to uh, um, help more than 60 uh, businesses and also 10,000. We had more than 10,000 participants in our training uh, and programs. We worked with international and national uh, uh, organizations to execute the program, and we have also access to a network of incubators to uh, seek their help uh, in, in executing our program. These are some of our souvenirs from our programs. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. And if you need to reach us, you can uh, follow us online on social media or uh, see our websites for any further information. Thank you. Thank you, Asisa, for your presentation and for what you are doing for young people that need uh, that extra push for them to embrace agriculture, without which most of, it, most of them will always view it as something obsolete and something not uh, easily embraceable for young people. As elaborated by Beth, we, the young people, are the bedrock of agriculture. We cannot talk about sustainability without embracing the role of young people. Thank you, Ujo. Now. We come back to Europe. Let's come back to Europe as our last speaker is Martha Wenzel. She is from Germany and she's the CEO and co-founder of eTerry. So we come from incubators to agro-robotics. Martha, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Martha. I'm the CEO and co-founder of eTerry and yeah, I'm truly excited to be able to speak here today, surrounded by all these inspiring people and getting impulses from all over the world. Um, yeah, we are a German startup on the mission to advance sustainable agriculture on a large scale through robotics and AI. And yeah, I was asked to share here um, to, today um, yeah, what we are doing uh, at eTerry and how we are approaching um, agriculture. And um, yeah, our story started in 2018 when my co-founder and the inventor of the eTerry, Michael, was asking himself, you know, if humanity is able to send robots to different planets like the Mars rover Curiosity back, back in the day, um, who was, you know, put into a rocket and sent over 200 million kilometers to a different planet, um, why are we not using this knowledge here on planet Earth? And uh, yeah, that's how the whole eTerry idea was born. And um, the interesting part is that Michael is not a studied engineer. He grew up on a family owned farm and studied product design at the Bauhaus University. And this is a school teaching to unify craft and technology and yeah, to create products that are useful and accessible to the masses. The Bauhaus philosophy is really based on the principles that less is more and that yeah innovation and user uh, being user centric um is is the essence of of good products and if you keep those principles in mind you um, and apply this to agriculture this is uh, what comes out of it and it's super lightweight extremely flexible robot that adheres to yeah the different requirements in agriculture because yeah agriculture is extremely diverse and um, 
yeah, the question some might ask is why do we need a robot anyway? And yeah, especially here um, in the northern hemisphere, I feel like um, we we need we know that we need to be uh, producing food way more sustainably and with way higher way higher outputs as well. And the problem that we're trying to tackle is that, especially in organic um, farming, um, it is here very difficult to realize that on a large scale. Uh, so. The farmers here, um, especially in Europe, are really dependent on manual labor. So uh, this is combined with a severe staff shortage. And if you think, for example, of the crop onion, um, people or farmers need just 400, or need more than 400 hours per hectare to just remove weeds manually. So that's an immense amount of time. And uh, yeah, in many parts of, of the world, uh, people are confronted with the same problem. Yeah, and because food is getting, uh, growing food is just getting way more challenging in, because the climate conditions are changing, the conditions on the field are changing, and the cost and effort to grow food in this, in this environment is just increasing constantly. And this is exactly where we as Eteri come into play, because yeah, we develop an autonomous, multifunctional, and highly flexible field robot that is really built to automate um, sustainable farming practices on a larger scale. And with the Eteri, we are really uh, yeah, rethinking agricultural machinery because we want to move from this uh, bigger and bigger uh, tractors back to a more small scale solution that uh, yeah, is just um, very flexible, adapts to any field, and that can be equipped with various tools and sensors. And here on the picture, you can see um, the Eteri with our first use case, which is an implement for the for the removal of weeds uh, in vegetable crops. And also what we are doing is that we have a lot of cameras integrated on the robot. So we collect an ever increasing amount of data, which we then use to give farmers new insights on their crops down to the individual plant. So yeah, anyway, the best way to understand the concept of the Eteri is to see it in action. And the idea is that this very lightweight design is... Uh, yeah, it's very soil friendly. Uh, it adapts to different track widths and heights, meaning that we can actually uh, yeah, integrate it in various crops and growth stages at the same time. We have uh, lithium iron batteries, meaning that the robot runs fully electric. And uh, we have also on fields very often very challenging terrains. And maybe it's a coincidence, but we're working together with the company that also runs uh, motors in the Mars rover, uh, which is the reason why mud and slopes are not uh, that much uh, of a problem for us. And very important is that we follow a modular concept, meaning that uh, we can easily replace or maintain parts or components. And uh, yeah, we really took a lot of care to make it industrial so that it is just um, easy, easy maintenance. Yeah, a crucial part of uh, our technology is that we are using AI in order to, um, yeah, make, make uh, give new insights uh, for farmers how each individual crop on the field is doing. So um, we also use it for autonomous navigation. And in the end, uh, yeah, farmers just get for the individual plant insights on water availability, size of the plant, or also yield predictions. And um, in the end, this algorithm is really designed that the farmer can interact with it. So just by taking a few pictures, the farmer can actually yeah, uh, uh, customize the, the algorithm to his or her individual requirements on the field. And this makes the system just way more robust and way more accessible. And speaking of accessibility, this is a huge problem in the sector because um, yeah, we can develop the most innovative technologies, but we need to keep the entry barriers for farmers as low as possible. And um, especially, so medium and small size, sized farms can actually yeah, uh, use these kinds of technologies. And there is a good reason why many farmers are still a bit skeptical about uh, introducing these super new technologies to their operations because they fear tech obsolescence, um, 
they feel the high costs, which are often in the six digit range. And uh, obviously, farmers are no robotics engineers, meaning that they can't just fix something when it, when it breaks. However, farmers do trust their agricultural service providers, their retailers and contractors, and that's why we are basing our business model on that. So uh, we offer the Eteri as a service robot, which the farmer can book just very flexibly. And uh, in parallel, we build up this network of um, contractors who perform the weeding service on our behalf, basically. So they are responsible for the setup on the field and they are also the first level support in case the machine doesn't run as autonomous as it should. Yeah, and as you can see, the good thing about this is that, um, yeah, everyone really benefits from it, like from this automation technology. So the farmers save cost and time and uh, the service providers uh, yeah, really get higher margins than with their actual contract work. And yeah, to be fair, um, yeah, we still need a bit to bring this technology to the market. So um, we need some time and still some money. So we are currently raising our second investment round and we plan to bring this technology to market by uh, 2025, having um, currently already pilots and intensifying this uh, in the coming season. And yeah, what I really want to talk about is uh, our team because this is really um, the superpower behind Eteri. We are currently eight people with six nationalities and uh, yeah, we are really working hard to make all of this happening that uh, I was just explaining uh, before. And what I think is really special is that we all came together from all over the world in a tiny town in Germany to work on this product and bring it onto the fields. And most of us actually grew up on a farm. So uh, yeah, we can all really relate to the struggles of farmers. And the, the thing is just that these people here, they developed into amazing engineers, robotic specialists or AI specialists and uh, are now working to yeah, change agriculture for the better. And yeah, even though we are still a pretty young team, I mean, that's also the, the, the topic for today. Um, we are really passionate and I think that's uh, the key to, to driving success uh, in, this, in this area. And yeah, together we are working towards this vision to provide an all-rounding farming companion that enables an agriculture that is resilient, efficient and sustainable. And uh, that also on a large scale. And yeah, we really imagine very biodiverse fields with high density of various crops. And to manage this complexity, we are uh, convinced that just robotics and AI are the key to, to, to make this happen. And instead of having this one size fits all approach, we really want to get down to plant level and provide as many farmers as possible with precision farming technologies and give the farmers the insights they need in order to uh, yeah, grow the crops properly. And in the end, yeah, we strongly believe that this way of farming has an immense potential to grow food in harmony with nature and yeah, to provide healthy and affordable food for all of us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marta. I, I like a lot how you presented the team that is so diverse and also the part of your vision is that biodiversity, pushing for biodiversity and supporting um, resilience. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. This AgroRobot promises to be great in the field. Now, let us give the speakers that we had a big round of applause again. Thank you so much. And I Thank you so much. And now we can move to the um, question and answer uh, session, the discussion. And please, Beth, uh, intervene anytime because we're eager to hear from you, questions, insights, and so on. So who wants to break the ice and go first with the question? Sha. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, many. I think this, you know, side event is amazing. It's so good. You know, when we heard the young people, they really represent the future. And we know that. And what is sustainability? Sustainability means for the future development, right? 
use its future. So I can say today, this site is really so good. And the five speaker on behalf of a different perspective, make a very good insightful and encourage uh, this uh, presentation. I think my question maybe is really for everybody, think it over. What is the renowned of course? And agriculture mechanization and the digitalization together will be very, very important pillar for future transformation to our food system. And this is three four words is important, efficient. Yeah. Of course, the mechanization is efficient and the resilient mechanization play a very important role. Inclusive and then sustainable. These four words so important. So, of course, how can we realize it? Depends on the young people, young generation, because you are the future. So for like each young speaker here, what you're thinking is the most important aspect need, you need to support, yeah? You can see everybody, you can see what your the way of thinking, most important element or issue you support. And from a government, from a technical or stakeholder, anyways, okay. And this may be give a whole picture for the audience and say what's it. And please, I think this maybe we can do it one by one. And this maybe is very comprehensive, but I think it's important. We can get some clear idea what the future, what you need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take another question if we can, and then we move to the speakers. Yes. Please. No, I think we need the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks of all to the organizers for this really interesting session. Uh, I had a question to Martha regarding the ETRI. I was wondering, on what type of farms is it implementable? So you assess the individual needs of each plant, um, but then the farmer will have to intervene on individual plant level, which is also, again, a lot of work. So I was wondering, which scale of farm operation are you thinking of uh, applying this technology? And maybe a second question would be regarding the data collected. Who owns the data collected by the ET? Thanks. The first question was to each of you. So in keywords, um, what is it that must be done from your different perspective? And then Marta, the question is to you. So Marta, please. Yeah, so um, from our perspective, uh, what we currently need and what I also observe um, what other startups uh, or especially early start early stage startups need uh, in my bubble is really funding. So all the startups are currently relying a lot on private investors and uh, yeah, I'm fighting for for funding, and I think there is a huge lever um, for for governments or, or public organizations to fund um, yeah innovative projects uh, that are especially in the beginning um, very uh, costly uh, to develop. And yeah, if the pressure would be a little lower in this regard, that would uh, help a lot. Oui, je suis entièrement d'accord avec euh, cette question. Euh, il faudra aborder la question de durabilité au niveau des différentes entreprises et start-up en appuyant surtout des initiatives, de la facilitation à l'accès au financement et aux équipements, mais aussi de la formation. Pour ce qui est de l'Afrique, la, il faut surtout un transfert de compétences et de technologies, parce que vous savez, Nous parlons ici de, de mécanisation, mais qui ne s'arrête pas là. Nous avons besoin aussi ici de d'autres implications pour que ces aspects soient diffusés auprès des, des producteurs. Merci. Ah, OK. Uh, I represent uh, Rural Joe. Uh, my most recurring uh, concern is to make rural activities pro differently so that young people do not look for other opportunities outside their communities. And maybe if we use the mechanization, uh, we can uh, make more 
rental the crops and increase the participation of the young people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe uh, to transfer the sustainable and more digital agriculture mechanization, we need to focus on developing such an institution which is more inclusive, efficient, resilient, and sustainable uh, by capacitating them. I mean, I believe creating so many institutions uh, is not uh, worth, but capacitating each institution for different aspect uh, is a better way for transformation. So I uh, once again focus on capacitating the institution that we currently have for uh, agriculture 1.0 to agriculture 5.0. Thank you. Marta, you want to respond to the second question? Yes, so I believe it was in what kind of fields and uh, what happens to the data. So um, with the ITERI, we focus on high value crops, meaning that at the moment we are um, currently uh, in vegetable uh, crops, uh, specifically onions and sugar beets. And um, I would say the size of the field in the end doesn't matter that much uh, because uh, we want to fully automate um, the uh, the individual processes on the field. I mean, we're starting off with weeding, um, but uh, yeah, you can also think that further in terms of doing the seeding or um, doing precision spraying or precision uh, irrigation. And uh, the ITERI is a very small scale solution, right? So. Uh, we think it more in a swarm uh, setting that uh, many smaller robots go um, over the field and um, yeah the precision down to the plant will like is a bold uh, is a bold um, yeah way uh, to do or to to go and for sure that's still quite in the future um, however yeah that's like we are starting with um yeah these these uh, data um hotspots for example um yeah here is a is a spot where um you need to irrigate i don't know a, like 10 square meter or so and um, then move on from there and regarding the data yeah so currently um data protection is uh, not as clear like whom uh, like how to how to uh, settle this um, we have the uh, yeah, um, agreement with our farmers that uh, we are allowed to collect that data and only use it for the purposes of improving our AI algorithm and not giving it uh, to someone else because, uh, of course, it's very, very uh, sensible uh, data as well. Um, yeah, and for the future, there are for sure some policies needed uh, to make it clear on how to, how to handle this. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. We have another question. Thank you. Um, so for the presentations and um, the inspiring story of those uh, panelists. My uh, question goes to, uh, to Beth, because uh, at the beginning she was, first I need to present myself. My name is Marcia Liba. I'm a food consultant. I'm based in the UK. I'm campaigning for uh, the taxation of um, agriculture in Africa for the past 15 years advising um, uh, the diaspora uh, to buy tractors and send to Africa. To date, I've had about 30 people to buy tractors and send to Africa. My question goes to Beth, um, you know, in addition to what she said at the beginning, what the FAO can do uh, to help people like Kwame and others um, in line with either um, fulfill the goals of, um, you know, improve farming in Africa and also obviously fight hunger. Um, what will if, uh, the FAO do in Africa in terms of the development of those models? Yeah, we have those models champions uh, and we need to multiply them on the continent to be able to create wealth, okay, and fight hunger. And I think that the FAO can have, have a leverage there working with the government to create uh, those, um, those champions in the different fields of agriculture, because those guys, if you look at the case of Kwame, within a very short period of time, he was able to impact the life of thousands. If I had a government to be able to put such a program, it would have taken them decades to be able to do that. And secondly, as well, in terms of, yes, we want to encourage people to bring in more and more farmers, more and more tractors, 
especially in Africa, there are barriers in terms of importing taxes. We have government putting in uh, duty taxes. Uh, and there are even some government who will say, okay, you cannot import taxes that are 10 years older. Well, I think that, again, if you're working for government, can have leverage in terms of, well, you know, we want to bring more tractors. We want you to achieve things like zero hunger in 2030. We need tractors. We could be not putting duties because that would be a barrier in pushing tractors. And I think FAO can play that role. And I would like to know what will FAO will do in, you know, in, in, those, in those cases. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yes, we have the big boss to respond to that. <laughs> those are um, really important questions and, and big questions. And I'm going to try to maybe be as, as specific as possible because um, I would say in some of these areas, I mean, clearly here we are in 2023, really, I think, as FAO for a, a first time bringing a very intense focus on a topic like sustainable agricultural mechanization. Um, the intensive focus that FAO is finally bringing to all of its work around science and innovation and technologies is a relatively, relatively new development for us with the creation of a chief scientist position and a new office of innovation. But when I think about these kinds of advancements for us as an organization, to the work that we can do with you and other partners in Africa specifically. I think of, at least in the near term, sort of three maybe more concrete um, activities that are in motion as we speak. So the first is clearly with our country offices, the very important point you make about policy decisions that national governments are making. Um, this is a really challenging time with the climate crisis, with the war in Ukraine, markets being disrupted, policy actions being taken by national governments, um, oftentimes political decisions being taken as opposed to market-driven ones. The advice, the counsel, the steady hand that an organization like FAO can provide in advising those governments on keeping markets open, not putting in place trade restrictions, and thinking much more carefully about the kinds of support policies that you're describing, whether that be for tractors or equipment or even other inputs as important as fertilizer. Um, these are really important moments and we are having ongoing conversations through our country offices with many of the national governments in Africa specifically, so that's one. The second, through some recent uh, new financial support that has come to FAO, we are beginning to undertake some very important, seems basic uh, project work, but we are moving into, I think it's three to four to start, different African countries doing very preliminary basic soil mapping. And this soil mapping uh, foundation is really important in this particular moment when you think about productivity, you think about fertilizer use and efficiency. There's a lot of people who simply just wanna say, get more quantity of fertilizer into the hands of African farmers. And from the last few days that we've been here, and I think the mindsets of the people in the room, the presentations that we've heard, we know that it's about precision use of inputs, sustainable agricultural mechanization, conservation agriculture, smart agriculture. But when you don't have the underlying data and information, the variation of your soil types, the uniqueness of those soil types, you don't know where to start. And again, for some of the agricultural producing countries in the developed world, that's something that has been accomplished decades ago. So getting that right, getting it right now is I think something that lets us move even further. And the third concrete thing that we are doing in this moment is we are um, in the process of what we call a reimagination of a very important platform that FAO founded over 30 years ago called the Farmer Field Schools. This is a really important offering that FAO um, initiated. It's got many, many different partners now globally who are participating in this training, knowledge, research-driven, facilitation, advisory 
channel mechanism platform to farmers specifically. It's the place that we have been able to get insights into the best production practices. It's the place where I think we can do more around mechanization and training and capacity building. And we know that it's 30 years old. It's been hugely successful, but the world has changed around us very quickly. In those 30 years, we've gone from agriculture 2.0, 3.0 to agriculture 5.0. And we need a farmer field school and training uh, programs that are, are ready for agriculture 6, 7, 8, and 9, um, because they are coming and they are coming for everybody. So those I hope are a few examples of some things that we take very seriously in, in this moment. Thank you so much. Uh, as we wind down, I want us to just to pick one question from our online audience. We've had people from France, from Sudan, from different, from Zambia, from Nepal joining us. And that currently we are at 63 participants. And one question from um, Desmond is saying, how can these agricultural machinery options be made available for young people that want to, to start up like um, uh, Kwame? How can we make these agricultural mechanization options available to young people who would want to be like the next farmers? Kaume, you would like to answer that? La accessibility des jeunes au matériel agricole est très important. Il y a plusieurs modèles. Moi, le modèle qui a fonctionné avec nous, c'est le crédit crédit by. Nous avons approché un concessionnaire, lui avons démontré notre passion pour la mécanisation. Nous avons mis les dispositions en place et ça nous a permis d'avoir le premier tracteur sous Crédit Bail. Et une fois qu'on a travaillé à rembourser le premier prêt, nous avons eu d'autres partenaires tels que l'État de Côte d'Ivoire qui s'est invité et qui nous a subventionner en mettant en place d'autres équipements au bénéfice des producteurs. Donc, à part le crédit bail, il faut aussi penser à d'autres mécanismes pour financer des structures comme la nôtre qui interviennent directement auprès des producteurs. Merci. Thank you, thank you so much for me for that. The yeah, last hand. Very short, please, because we need to close. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it easy for, for you. Um, but access to finance is obviously a, 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 an important component here. How do we uh, create access to farmers of finance? But in the youth context, you know, farmers in the developing world are older people in average. You know, youth which are people that do not have decision power of the farm, that do not have the land ownership. How far are we in creating financial solutions for the younger that are starting in rural communities that do not have that financial ability, that do not have the minimal collateral that even the older farmer community does not have? How far can we push that agenda of really trying to create new alternative financial technologies to support young people in adopting new technology, new machinery. Thank you. I think there will be a great question for Asisa. Asisa, are you with us? Um, can you unmute and respond? Yes. yes, yes, I'm with you. Yes, um, I, I, I'm, I really agree with this question because uh, we, we had to work with a lot of young people who were more um, open to use technology and it was more easier for them to use technology to uh, increase their productivity. But they had also a lot of issues in relation to uh, owning the land, in relation to the logistics, and also funding. Most of them were uh, funding themselves and their projects. So uh, we work basically with a lot of partners to, uh, to put a place funding opportunities for them, and also to continue uh, our work through the center to ensure that they have uh, access to, to market. Because 
most of them are working in rural areas and they don't have a lot of resources to commercialize their products and they also lack funding and uh, at any moment landowners also can uh, take their land back from them and which is make uh, the work more insecure. So uh, we uh, work closely with them uh, on these challenges, um, uh, but there is a lot of work to be done, especially in Mauritania, um, in terms of uh, uh, training, in terms of uh, even putting in place funds for, uh, for small businesses. Thank you, thank you so much. Maybe a round of applause for everything as we reach the close. At, at, at this time, I take the privilege of inviting closing remarks Joseph Kingsley, who is the lead for, for mechanization in NS. Thank you, <clears throat> Vuyo, and thank you, Meiling. Um, wow, this has been a remarkable event. You have really taken us around the world with your stories. and. What I have sensed is, I think, if I use one word, maybe for, your, for you also, it's the word passion. I have seen, heard passion for sustainable agriculture mechanization. And in a way, that's from you people who we had the feeling we almost have lost the use in sustainable agriculture mechanization. And uh, so that's really a very, good, um, a very good achievement, I think, at this point. So... <clears throat> If I quickly go through, have you heard from Cote d'Ivoire, from the FIRM BioSAL uh, incubator? They were working on addressing critical issues like the role of quality seeds, fair pricing and sensitization towards labor intensive farming, which is very important. Then we went to Mexico, where we saw um, the need and the usefulness of a mechanization higher service center which was with a lot of different machines and there was still a lot of animal traction which is sometimes forgotten in this discussion but it's still existing still an important role in in many developing countries but i saw also very innovative equipment there which was also truly inspiring then we went to nepal and here i think we need to note that nepal has with the help of feo developed an updated mechanization policy and strategy and I want to come back to the, to the last question. I mean, this revamped policy and strategy on mechanization that is owned by the government and by the people, you can then also in, build in there the enabling environment and maybe incentives, maybe for use finance um, and for helping the, the incubator scene to, to evolve better. So I think sometimes it starts with a good strategy, a policy document, that helps the government to, to focus on this area. And the Nepal has, has done that, and I think that's a good example. <clears throat> then from there, we went to Hadina, I think, incubator in Mauritania, and I think that speaks for itself. It was a great presentation, and I'm really impressed about the country is not easy, and um, congratulations to, to, that, to that incubator story. Finally, we arrive at um, <clears throat> E-Terry, which is amazing. I mean, you start from Mars and you then start thinking about why Mars if you have similar needs in, in our agricultural fields. And these are people who have not been from agricultural sector, just young people from various um, countries and continents. And I think the, the progress you made is really, really impressive. Um, uh, I'm truly, um, I think, promising for the future. And I hope you find the investors that you obviously are looking for. <clears throat> well, what I can say for myself, I am re-energized on this. And um, I think with this, I think we can walk out to the next events that are already starting. But before I close, I would like to acknowledge that this side event would not have been possible without the use in FEO. It was actually organized by the youth group of FEO and specifically the NSP division who took the lead in this event. And so a special thanks to Mailing, to Vuyo, but also Heiko, who has already left, who was also part of it. And then thanks again to all our speakers. Thanks to Beth for being here all along the whole event. And um, please keep on talking to us and keep on engaging with us because we need you. We need your inspiration. And 
With that, this event is closed. Thank you very much. Thank you.